Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, so we'll get st started. So just to quickly uh, recap, um, see we basically looked at uh, how the data gets uh, distributed uh, in the big data scenario and uh, we also briefly looked at what sort of uh, compute and communication model uh, that it is useful for uh, solving these machine learning problems in a distributed setting. And we did some basic uh, cost analysis for the loss function computation. One can carry out similar analysis for every step of the basic uh, learning algorithm that we uh, saw. <coughs> and we also briefly covered uh, you know, few distributed computing strategies, which you saw as parameter mixing under the iterative parameter mixing. So now, uh, because our goal is to design an efficient distributed machine learning algorithm, let's do this cost analysis in little more uh, details, which will motivate us uh, to that uh, uh, topic. So this is just a quick reminder, which you already saw, uh, so I'll just skip. So the main thing is we'll be focusing on this part of it. Um, just to uh, quickly recap on the <coughs> notations n refers to the number of uh, total number of examples m is number of examples per node i use the notation n underscore p just to remove that dependency p i just uh, introduce this new notation m here and p is number of nodes d is feature di dimension and uh, you know in that uh, Basic learning algorithm, we said that there is an, I mean, it's an iterative algorithm. So this M refers to that uh, number of iterations. So here I'll call it a global or outer iterations. And I also introduced uh, a new variable called M underscore P, which is uh, the number of iterations um, that one may have to do uh, you know, locally. Uh, for example, let's say you want to run a stochastic gradient descent algorithm locally then you may have to pass through many examples or something there, right? So, um, so there are uh, several distributed machine learning algorithms, uh, you know, which carry out this, I mean, which require several iterations in order to produce um, good model parameter or uh, direction for the uh, optimization algorithm and so on. Um, so let's, I mean, in some sense you have seen all this uh, before, uh, but it is good to go over it. So let's assume that we are in that instance wise uh, partitioning uh, space and uh, there are two quantities that we want to compute. One is this uh, total computation cost and the other one is uh, the total communication cost. Um, so the notation C comp refers to the you know uh, the compute this comp refers to the computation cost and uh, here comp refers to the communication cost. So the here you can see that uh, this is called the total because you know the term P appears here. Although I may do the computations parallelly, if you want to look at what is the total computation cost, you have to add them, right? So the factor P appears here. And then we see this factor MP coming here, uh, which I mentioned before, which is if in each node there are multiple iterations involved, uh, then uh, the factor MP comes here. And uh, between these two, you see this uh, product M times D, because as you have seen before in the instance where it's partitioning, uh, in order to compute quantities, quantities like function, um, the computational cost at that time we saw as n underscore p times d 
which is what is written here as uh, m times d here. So, MP appears because of uh, you know local learning algorithm run over multiple iterations. Example is stochastic gradient descent running over multiple examples. And uh, M is needed because you may do one pass over all the instances and D is needed because you may look at all the features. In general, even just one look of all that uh, entire matrix X will cost that. Of course, you know this cost may be slightly I mean reduced if you have a sparse data, but for our analysis let us just keep it this way. Now, let us look at this uh, communication cost. So, here again you know this P comes in because imagine a situation where each worker node has to communicate uh, a d dimensional vector to the master and vice versa. For example, the master may update the weight vector and send it back to each one of these nodes. So, so that is why you get in, uh, this term. And this factor m comes because you have the number of uh, outer iterations or the global iterations. So, your total cost is going to be p times d times uh, m here. So, that is on the cost part. Now, let us introduce some notation to capture this time part where T p refers to local computation time taken per node. So, you are doing certain operations. Now, you look at how much time it will take to complete that uh, computations. And uh, similarly, you can define uh, there is I mean uh, the global computations happen in the master node. So, you can ask how much time uh, that master node takes. and. Uh, now, we said that there is a communication phase where worker nodes communicate something to the master and vice versa. So, there is some com communication time involved to transfer information per iteration. And uh, depending on the programming framework that you use, there may be a setup time. I mean, it may not be there also. So, so then it is, you know, it is very simple thing to see that the total computation cost is nothing but the local computation times plus global computation times multiplied by g because the one you see within the parenthesis is the per iteration cost. Now, we introduced the, the setup time also as part of uh, communication time here, but uh, that is ok. Um, this I already mentioned. So, you know this may not arise in all situation, but if it arises then you need to take into account. Um, and the TC is the main thing that you know we may we will have to worry about because this actual communication cost uh, that you cannot uh, avoid as long as you transfer some data back and forth. Now, the main comment is I mean of course, the total time is the sum of these two and then uh, the main thing is in the distributed settings this uh, T communication time can be significant. This particularly happen in uh, commodity clusters situation. So, we looked at the cost and then we looked at the time. Now, we can uh, try to look at what happens. Let us say if we were to run a, a distributed batch gradient descent algorithm. So, in this case, I have assumed that there is a sparse data. So, this n z by p is the per computation cost and you can you know work it out why this factor 2 comes when you look at that batch gradient descent algorithm. Now, the communication cost is defined by this you know term beta times p times d. p you know why it comes, d you know why uh, it comes because if I want to pass d dimensional vector that much cost you need to incur. But now what is this um, factor beta? See, our goal is to compare uh, the computation and then communication cost. So, we want to understand what is the relative role played by each one of these. So, that is why you know this factor beta is important. So, typically in order to do one floating point operation, the time taken is lot less. Whereas, if you want to transfer some smaller chunk like one byte of data or something, the cost could be different. So, we want to factor that into account. So, in other words, computation speed is typically high, communication speed is low. So, now this factor could be 
lie in the range of 10 to 100 depending on the actual communication infrastructure that you use. One thing I want to make here is that, uh, you know, we considered a very naive model where uh, the workers directly communicate to the master. But that is not necessarily the only model that one needs to work with. So one can look at, you know, sort of a tree topology where, you know, you connect two nodes together and then uh, they in turn get connected and so on, which can help in uh, uh, reducing this factor P to log P. These are all standard tricks that people use in networking community and so on. So, but that's fine. But as long as you keep in mind that, you know, it need not be always P, you can make it efficient by taking something into account on the system side or constructing a tree topology, that's good. Now, we would like to consider, you know, two regimes where what we call a small D regime and then a large D regime. Now, the reason why we are doing this because if you look at this communication cost, uh, that is dependent on D. Because once, let us say you have chosen the number of nodes, that is P is fixed and the beta is also fixed once you have the system. So now, the communication cost is completely dominated by this uh, variable D. So, let us say if your D is a small, now what it means is that this cost is not going to be much which basically means your communication cost is going to be far less than the computation cost, which basically means you will get nearly linear speed up in P because effectively all computations are parallelized. So therefore, you get this speed up of P. But the situation is not so good when this D becomes a very large. Okay, that is where the problematic thing. Now comes the question that how do we trade off this computation versus communication cost to speed up the algorithm. So that is the main theme here. So this is an important thing to note and understand. All right. So whatever highlighted in blue we have already covered. So let us get into that uh, you know, last but one part of this. So efficient distributed machine learning algorithms. So we will look at the three uh, algorithms. Um, there are few things to keep in mind. One is, see, our goal is to trade off computation and the communication costs. So, we will understand how each one of these, we will try to highlight how each one of these algorithms uh, handles that part. Second thing is, these are not the only methods uh, that you will see in the literature. There are many uh, different uh, methods. And what I have chosen is, you know, one particular case of instance wise partitioning and then uh, um, what are some of the popular methods that uh, uh, we know of? And uh, similar situation exists in the feature wise partitioning scenario also, which I am not uh, covering in today due to lack of time, but those references are given at the end of this uh, uh, PDF, so you can look at that. So, just to come back before I get into the details of these algorithms, I just want to highlight some four key ideas that are used to do this uh, you know, trade off. So, we saw that you know that total communication time is uh, you know given by this factor. Um, now, as I said before this T s is the setup time and the T T T c is the actual that data transfer time or communication cost associated with that. So, before the all this spark and then Hadoop yawn and all these versions came, the problem was still difficult to solve in that Hadoop map reduce pre on version of that. So, so one thing that people wanted to do was okay, this T s is really killing the speed up that one will get uh, to make the algorithm efficient. So, this Agarwal et al, they came up with a nice Hadoop compatible all reduce framework idea. Uh, I will briefly talk about it later. Um, in order to reduce this time uh, completely, or may not be completely, but mostly, yeah. And of course, you know, there are these new frameworks that have come up. So, if you really look at it in this, so this TS part is to a large extent uh, addressed. So, this is one um, basic idea and the other one is 
uh, which I briefly mentioned before which is the cost is this beta times the p times the d. Now if you use a proper uh, I mean some sort of optimal topology you may be able to reduce this cost to log b log p times d or something. In other words this p gets reduced to log p d still remains do not read it as log time I mean log of p d but t still remains. And the other one is that even when you have such a tree structure when you have a you know, large amount of data you can implement it in a pipeline way so that you can even reduce this factor log p even further okay. There will be still some cost but it will not be as high as log p or something okay. So this is another trick that people use to you know uh, reduce the I mean in this case now you can see one is I mean there are only three terms here right. So if you reduce one of that you hope to get some improvement out of it. So this part talks about reducing T s and this part to some extent address reducing T c. Now the third one that is left out is uh, m. So Yeah, that's all covered uh, as part of that. Yeah, yeah. All right. Okay. So the third uh, thing that we see is this, yeah, which is the number of outer iterations in that uh, iterative algorithm. And uh, of course, you know, it's obvious that if you reduce the number of outer iterations, your communication cost uh, goes down. Now, uh, you know, there are several ways to do that. So one is now from optimization uh, you know uh, talks you learnt that SGD has better initial convergence okay. This is some experimental result I am not sure whether Cheejan showed or Suvrij showed. And the LBFGS like second order methods they have better convergence uh, near the solution. So the one obvious thing that comes to the mind is that now can I make use of this observation and use it in some way. Uh, to reduce these number of iterations yeah. so that is the basic idea. So again this Agarwal et al they proposed a hybrid method. So what they do is in step 1 let us say that I mean the data is distributed in uh, p nodes. Now what you do is that you first uh, run this stochastic gradient descent algorithm parallelly in each one of these nodes okay. So you just to do your few passes uh, typically even you know less than 5 number of passes is sufficient to get a good solution. But they are all computed for individual nodes now you combine them and you get one weight vector similar to what we saw in the parameter mixing uh, method. Now Yeah, yeah, correct. So that cost is fixed, right? We are not now correct. Yeah, yeah. I mean, ideally, you should include it. So, yeah. But that is fixed now. Once the data is distributed, now I am going to run the algorithm. Now, how do I reduce that part? That's what you are. Yeah. Example of <coughs> oh framework. These already use framework. Uh, what I mentioned here, right? So that is uh, something that people use. Yeah. I mean, are you asking that it is natively supported? Is that your question? No, no, this is a specialized thing that they developed this Hadoop compatible already use framework which they this Agarwal at all they developed. Yeah. I mean if you ask whether it is available as part of native Hadoop, no, no. 
Okay. All right. So this is a simple trick that they used based on the observation from that you know optimization uh, uh, literature and uh, this one. But it's very effective, actually. Yeah. Uh, the point is that. I mean, you don't have to think that we have to do really very complicated a thing to make this algorithm efficient. Even, I mean, uh, such observation really help you to uh, design effective algorithm. I mean, that's the main point, right? And uh, yeah. that's a nice thing they did in this uh, work, actually. Yeah. Then this is another example. So where uh, we want to again reduce uh, this number of outer iterations. Uh, so if you look at you know we are solving an optimization problem uh, which iteratively and then so what we are trying to do is we are at the current uh, iterate w of t or something we want to take the next step so one of the important thing is that you need to find out which direction to move okay and if you can find a good direction then the progress that you will make will be good and the hope is that you know you will be able to solve the problem much more quickly. In other words, the number of iterations that you need to, outer iterations that you need to take will be a lot lesser. In that process, you reduce this communication cost. So the idea that is proposed uh, in this work is basically, you know, I want to find a better descent direction, but then finding better descent direction doesn't come for free. So you may have to increase the uh, computation cost. Okay. So the main uh, observation or suggestion from this work is that make a communication cost commensurate with the computation cost. And this is achieved, for example, you know, you have a better local learning algorithm. Suppose you imagine that, you know, uh, there is a local learning algorithm which will do multiple passes over the data locally. Okay. And let's say it runs k times. Now each uh, time you run, you incur a cost of this N0 over P. So the total cost, computation cost per node uh, turns out to be just a product of that. Now the idea is that, okay, now if I increase K, now my this total local computation time goes up. Now if I can adjust my K, then you can sort of make it to commensurate. Now of course the question is that, you know, why should I do this? Your goal is to get better uh, descent uh, direction. So that's where the trade-off comes into picture. Now we'll see how that can be done. Now uh, one thing is that, of course, we are coming up with this new algorithm, and then they all look like a bunch of tricks. But ultimately, you know, we have to make sure that whatever distributed machine learning algorithm you come out with, we have to make sure that they converge, because my goal is to solve that original optimization problem. And if, I, for example, if I take a convex optimization problem, I want to get to the global solution, not stop somewhere and then get some suboptimal solution. So that's something one has to ensure. And uh, other thing is that, uh, okay, so when you are doing it, also, you know, this batch gradient isn't is an exact algorithm. We know that. So which basically means that you better get the same accuracy, which is equivalent to getting the global solution. So the, now the question we are asking is that whatever new algorithm that we come up with, can we do much faster than the naive distributed batch gradient descent? Now in a distributed setting, if you ask the question, is it always possible? Probably not. Okay. And that's the little bit of a tricky part. Okay. So because we already saw that for when uh, number of features is very small, the communication cost is quite less. So even simple this distributor BGD can give you that linear speed up. Okay. So you may not really gain. So it depends on the real scenario and also the communication cost of the underlying infrastructure that you are working with. So, so now the question, so there is one algorithm at least we know that this, this FADL stands for functional approximation based distributed learning algorithm. Uh, which can meet all these uh, expectations. So just to give a quick idea about that uh, method. So as earlier we assume that you know 
data is distributed instance wise and uh, so this paper uh, this work assumes the uh, works with a linear model and it is also the uh, up, uh, works in the primal space. So here is the last function that we have this is the standard regularizer and you have the last function uh, return as sum over the nodes because we are dealing with the instance wise partitioning. And our goal is to get a better descent direction right so that is the goal here. Now what this method does is uh, the core idea is the following. Now so each node wants to uh, find the weight vector uh, w let us say right. Now the best way to do that is um, to have all the data in that node but that is not feasible okay. So how do I get that? So only way you can do is that sort of approximate the function the last function that represent the other nodes okay. So which basically means if your approximation is good basically what you are saying is that individual node is optimizing the whole objective function but this may not be always true but the idea is just to make that uh, approximation. Now when you do that approximation then because you have information about the data present in the other node the hope is you will be able to make you know better judgment of how to move that is the basic uh, idea. So which is what is pictorially shown here. Um, so here this f1 of omega uh, the w so that is the function that you have at node 1 and f2 is what you have at node 2 and the f of w what you see here is the total objective function. Now suppose if I am using only this information may be hard to find the you now appropriate descent direction on this uh, total function f of w. On the other hand here we pictorially show an approximation to this function f2 of omega. Now this f2 of f2 hat if you look at it it is a sum of these two which means f1 of omega plus the sum of this. Now if you look at this green function that looks closer to f of w in other words if you look at the minimum of these two function they look very close which basically means with this approximation I may be able to find a better direction to move in that process I will be able to converge faster that is the basic idea. Now of course you know since you are going to add this term it comes with some extra cost and after you have added this now you will do your local learning to compute the weight vector and so on. So the here is the whole algorithm but I will just to point out some key steps here without getting too much into the detail. Uh, so this for loop that you are seeing is that uh, outer loop and uh, this wr that you see is sort of the global weight vector and basically what happens is you compute the gradient uh, at this uh, current iterate at the global level and now you ask the question uh, you know whether I satisfy the termination criterion or not. Uh, if yes you uh, just go out if not then you pass that information to all the worker nodes and then do the parallel computation. Now this gradient information that gets passed to all the nodes right so that is needed to make that approximation that you saw here in other words in order to make this in order to get an estimate of this you need that gradient information okay. So that is the basic uh, idea. Now once you do that you know uh, this is step 3 what you see here is basically the parallel computations that happens in the p nodes and uh, you see an inner loop here. See that the k hat appearing here so this is where you have the local learning algorithm and you run through multiple iterations. So now the hope is that by controlling this parameter k hat we will be able to get better direction so that is the hope. Now so the algorithm basically uh, uh, the local uh, local computation algorithm is basically runs this k times and it produces an output and then what you do is you form a, a convex combination of that one can show that 
if this individual direction is descent, even the convex combination will also be a descent direction. So, so you can look at the paper for more details, but uh, that is the idea. And then at the master now you can do a line search in that direction and then decide what is the st step to take and then update the model parameter. So, the key thing to note here is that there is this control parameter k, k hat that we have now which can be used to make the trade off the computation and the communication cost. Uh, now, some key observations about the algorithm. So, um, so we are able to prove that this algorithm has global linear rate of convergence. I mean, uh, this global linear rate, you know what it means, which, because Suvrit and Chijan already talked about it. And it is a general method because the functional approximation that you make here, I mean you can choose which one to use. So, for example, a simple linear approximation has this form what is shown here and you can also have uh, you know quadratic uh, approximation and so on. And uh, in the experiments that I will show later, uh, we used this uh, quadratic approximation form and we found that the quadratic approximation form uh, gives better performance than this linear approximation. But of course, that comes with a little more cost. But the advantage is that the number of iterations that you need get reduced. So, in effect, you see good improvement in the efficiency on the algorithm. And the another nice thing about that algorithm is that since there is a local learning algorithm involved, you could use any algorithm. It could be stochastic gradient descent or Tron or anything. And the nice thing about this theoretical result is that the proof goes through for any of these uh, methods. Okay. And the other important thing that, you know, because we talked about, you know, the algorithm should converge. So, in order to prove certain convergence property, then one may ask the question that, A, you know, do I need to solve this problem locally exactly or can I do approximate solution? Uh, it turns out that, you know, even uh, you can do early stopping then and then uh, under certain condition you can show that the algorithm will converge. And there are other, you know, um, um, results. So, earlier I mentioned that iterative parameter mixing that we saw earlier does not have a proper convergence proof. And in this particular case, we are able to prove convergence because if you really look at it, what we are doing is this convex combination of this, which can be seen as an iterative parameter mixing algorithm. Therefore, we have a you know, provable convergence result for a IPM method. And this is also a good parallel SGD method and with some convergence proof. So, I will not get into the details of that. But the main point I want to make is that it is a very general method which is powerful as you will see from the results and it also has some nice properties. Okay, so, our goal was to uh, you know uh, design efficient uh, algorithm compared to the basic distributed batch gradient. So, this uh, slide shows uh, you know the analysis uh, of comparing distributed BGD method with the Fordal algorithm which I just described. So, this is not truly overall time actually there is a factor I am missing here, there is a typo there, but this is sort of a per iteration cost. And um, so, here you see different components playing this beta d we already saw which is the communication cost and the first term is basically the computation cost and as you can see here this MP is the number of iterations that you see here and this N is that by P is the per iteration cost and the D is depending on the method that you use. For example, if you are using Tron, there may be some dot products involved uh, due to which this cost comes in and uh, so depending on whether you are using both it you know, distributed BGD algorithm and Fordal algorithm can be, I mean the cost of that can be written in this form. So, this table gives you what are all these parameters C1, C2, C3 in these two different uh, settings. <coughs> so, as you can see here, uh, this distributed batch gradient, it is because it just computes the partial gradient. So, there is really nothing like inner iterations here. Whereas, this Fordal algorithm has this inner loop and then this k hat uh, comes here. 
and uh, and there is this factor too because of the what is the information that you send back to the uh, nodes. So now suppose if you assume that uh, the number of outer iterations is greater than three times that is needed for this, then um, one can show that you know uh, this relation. Um, I mean there is a proof in that uh, paper you can look at it, but the main point to, to note is you know uh, for FODL to give uh, good performance you will see that. Suppose if D is very, very large right, then you can show that this value will be very small which means that this uh, relation will be easily satisfied. So you will get good improvement with this FODL algorithm. And in fact, if you look at it, earlier we talked about a distributed BGD is not good for large D and there is exactly the scenario that uh, you know that comes in here. So for large D for which we wanted to address the problem that gets addressed effectively by this FODL algorithm. And because I mean of course this the factor N is appears here, but that is completely I mean uh, so if you have highly sparse data this N z will be small. So again you get uh, improvement with this. So this is something that you will observe in the results in the experiments. Now moving on to this uh, Terra scale uh, learning work. Now so as I said that they were uh, you know, trying to address that problem of setup time. So what they said was that in some sense you take control of all the worker nodes and then construct a topology and uh, how do they communicate with each other and so on. So basically uh, so that when you are going to run your uh, entire algorithm you know there is nothing like intermediately you store some data in the file system and then bring it back under nothing of that sort exists. So they, pro they proposed this spanning tree server model with each node. So this is I mean simple tree you have and imagine that each node has this parent IP, parent child IP addresses. And imagine that you can pass the information between these nodes by establishing TCP connections. So once this you know information is available and TCP connections are established, then you can run your algorithm until you finish your uh, complete, uh, you know, completely. So, so this already is basically does the following. So here is a simple example that I have written here. So. Let us say that these are the numbers that the one that are highlighted in red that are the one that are present in the node and now you simply want to aggregate and then pass it back to all the nodes. So this intermediate child node adds this number 14 plus 27 to get the answer 41 and similarly the right, right hand side child does the same thing and then they pass the information higher up where it gets added to produce the result 64 and then they send it back. So at the end what you see is that all the nodes have the aggregated information 64. Now this is something that is useful if you relate it to the uh, descent algorithm in the partial gradient computation. Now you can imagine that the partial gradient information is what is available in each one of these nodes and then they get pushed to the next level node where they get aggregated and so on and then finally at this node the entire gradient I mean all the partial gradients get aggregated and now you can push it back to all the nodes so that all of them have the same information. Now as you can see that if you use this architecture or this topology the communication cost will be that factor P will go from go to log P. So that is the basic uh, idea but one catch is there you know there is a limited fault tolerance because if any of these nodes uh, because you have taken control of this entire tree and then if something goes bad then uh, there is no one to fix that problem unlike what is available in a Hadoop uh, MapReduce uh, framework who takes care of that. So in order to address that problem what they you know they worked with some idea called a speculative execution. So what they do, do is that you know I said that in the first step they run this parallel SGD algorithm. So at the end of it you know there will be some uh, nodes that will uh, survive. So when they move to the next step they make sure that they work only with that uh, survivor nodes and then construct the tree and work with that. The hope is that after that those nodes would not fail I mean 
and this is something that experimentally they found and then found it to be very effective and then uh, they have some statistics which tells you even in um, several thousands of machines the probability of a node failing is so small so in the sense that within the time interval that occurs to run the algorithm this problem doesn't exist so in that sense you don't have to really worry about that problem but the idea itself is very nice and then you know the pipeline implementation one can imagine for the tree structure and then uh, this we already talked about i'll just go the last method i mean another method that we talk about is this um, communication efficient distributed dual coordinate descent this i just uh, took it uh, for two reasons one is you know it's a dual coordinate method and this is also very uh, effective and uh, it is the iterative primal dual algorithm it again works in that instance wise um parties and scenario so as you know that in the dual way, um, problem formulation you have this uh, coefficient alpha and you know that with each example there is a uh, coefficient alpha associated with that so now we are dealing with this instance wise partitioning what it means is that the alpha can be treated as sort of local variables for that particular for each partition okay so so this bp that i indicate here is corresponding to the set of examples that is present in the node and alpha bp represents the dual variables associated with those examples that's what it is here now in this uh, algorithm what they do is that they do this block maximization of these dual variables in each one of these node if you recall uh, chizen's presentation he talked about uh, optimizing the objective function on a subset of variables keeping rest of the things fixed I means i mean essentially you know similar thing you do here and we also saw that that w weight vector can be re represented as sum of um this you know dual variable times the input feature vector so using that relation you know they update this they find this uh, weight vector update and uh, using which the primal variable is updated and then uh, again that the same iterative uh, uh, loop is set now one question to ask is that you know why is uh, this per, i mean how is this algorithm trading of the computation and the uh, communication cost here again uh, the thing is that in the when you are doing the local computation how many iterations do you want to run so there is a control knob here in terms of you know how much time you want to spend in the uh, you know doing the local computation so that you can get better update here yeah this is uh, yeah this i mentioned enough and of and the, i think uh, all the experimental results they reported in that spark programming framework and the tss is insignificant uh, so there is one method uh, which you must know i don't remember uh, chijan or uh, surit talking about it but this is one important optimization method that you need it is good to know from distributed optimization perspective it's a very good uh, paper written by boy et al and then anybody who is interested in distributed optimization must read this paper and so very nicely written paper so basically they solve the problem of the following form i mean form shown here um so you have this function f of x and then you have so there are two sets of variables you have x and z and there are some constraints so basically their idea is to solve this uh, optimization problem using augmented lagrangian method using method of multipliers so due to lack of time i'll not get into the details of that but the main point is that um using this method uh we can we can solve that um the last minimization problem in that instance wise partitioning and uh, uh, this way so for example you can imagine this if i mean as earlier we have this uh, loss function defined for individual nodes that's what you see here and uh, each node maintains its own uh, weight vector that's what is indicated as wp and there is this global parameter w because ultimately you need a, a global solution w and these constraints are placed because um 
as you solve this algorithm iteratively, at the end you want all the weights to be you know same, um, same right? And uh, the nice thing about this algorithm is that you know there are three key steps here. One is um, given the global model WT and the Lagrangian variables associated with these constraints. You can solve the problem locally in parallel. So this is the parallel learning step and in the global learning basically given your current uh, iterates from all the nodes and the Lagrangian variables, how do you get to this uh, global weight and uh, there is a dual action step where you want to update the Lagrangian variables and this can be solved iteratively. So this in some sense has the flavor what we already saw. So it is a very nice algorithm. One, one tricky thing is that there is a parameter called rho which is a penalty parameter and it is a key quantity that we need to set it properly in order to get a good performance. But it is a nice method to try it out. So here are some experimental results. Um, so these are some of the data sets that uh, you know we experimented and uh, so these data sets are selected because of the you know, diversity as you can see here we are dealing with this big data scenario one is that only one thing at least we want to make sure that the number of examples is very large and since we are interested in uh, trading I mean we are interested in understanding how this computation and the communication trade off works, we wanted to vary the number of features. So you can see that it goes from you know uh, 784 to all the way up in millions of features. And uh, of course you can see that you know the sparsity is uh, quite high in four of these data sets whereas uh, you know uh, it is different in this uh, MNIST data set. And so this table basically uh, gives the computation to communication cost ratio and um, see whenever you are solving this machine learning problem now you want to you know. So there are two things one is you can observe how your objective function is uh, moving right and the other one is you can also look at how your performance is uh, improving. When I say performance, I am talking about accuracy or uh, area under precision recall curve and so on. So the numbers what you see here is when the algorithm was terminated uh, within 0.1 percent of the best value that you can get on 128 nodes, that is what this is, this table is giving. So which compares all these four different uh, algorithms on different data sets. Now as you can see here uh, this algorithm model gives a value close to 1 most all data sets whereas if you look at the cost they all vary quite uh, I mean they all vary quite a bit across different uh, algorithms and uh, you know by trading off this communication with the com uh, computation cost making the comments rate the algorithm is able to become a lot more efficient that is the main uh, point. So here are some uh, uh, results. So so this x axis shows the time taken in seconds and y axis is the relative function value difference. Basically you know if you run the algorithm to run for long time it will settle at some objective function value. Now with respect to that you measure uh, this quantity. Now so this is uh, for the KDD data set where uh, you know the number of features is very large right so I mean very high. So the left plot shows the performance with the P equal to 8 and the right plot shows the performance with the P is equal to 128 and the this FODAL algorithm is given by this uh, red line and the green is this COCO algorithm and uh, so on. So as you can see that the FODAL algorithm you know drops quite sharply compared to other methods in uh, both the scenario. And this is uh, on the MNIST data set. Now as you can see here 
compared to the earlier one, there are many methods that are coming closer to here because the dimensionality of this feature set is small. It is just 784. So the Fordell algorithm really has uh, you know, advantage when the number of features is uh, very high. And of course, we assume that the number of examples is large. And uh, so here, so this figure basically shows that how does e, I mean terrascal learning is a very good uh, you know um, algorithm. It's a state of the one of the state of the art methods. Um, so we wanted to compare how the other methods perform in terms of the time taken uh, with reference to that particular method. So this is again showing for two different uh, data set. One is MNIST and then uh, the right one is uh, right hand side you see for KDD data set. So if it is exactly same as uh, terrascal learning, then you expect a flat line here. Okay, I mean that one. If you see high value here, which means that the algorithm is better. So as you can see here, the improvement given by this Fordell algorithm is roughly five times and uh, that's sort of uniform across the number of nodes. On the other hand, on the MNIST data set, you don't see that much improvement. It is still good, but as the number of nodes increases, this becomes uh, really large. Because as you can see, when P becomes large, the communication cost also goes up. In some sense, you know, that explains why this happens. So that completes the, you know, whole story. So I don't have time to go through this, but pretty much we have covered all the topics in the distributed machine learning setting. So there are, you know, many other things that we didn't uh, cover. Uh, and of course, as I mentioned before, uh, we also have feature-wise uh, partitioning version of this functional approximation method. And uh, there are these parallel and distributed coordinate descent methods. So particularly, you know, there are some papers by Peter Isterich and et al. that you may want to look at. And uh, there is also a hybrid method Okay, which basically means you not only have that distributed setting, but even in each machine, you can true, you can do some uh, multi-threaded programming, so you get a hybrid method. And of course, we didn't talk about the non-linear kernel methods. And if you recall, Chijan talked about uh, the problem of storing this kernel matrix and how do we handle. So we have not talked about it. Um, and uh, there are a few other topics. So how do we learn uh, decision tree models deep? neural nets and so on. So you come to the last part. So of course there are some basic questions that keep coming, right? So why not subsample big data so that it can fit in a single machine and then work with that? Yes, it is possible in uh, some applications. In other words, you may not need the entire data to get the you know, maximum accuracy achievable. But then the trick is uh, how do we subsample the data? How do I know that the subsampled data can give me the maximum accuracy achievable? So that's a bit tricky. And uh, you know, in some cases, it's not possible because if you subsample it, you are going to lose on accuracy. This display site recognition data set is something that uh, Agarwal et al. showed that the performance difference can be you know, quite significant. So it doesn't make sense to do subsampling. And of course, you know, when you are looking at subsampling algorithm, then that needs to be efficient because otherwise you will defeat the purpose of having an efficient algorithm anyway. But, could also be, uh, but still, it is cost, right? So if you look at the overall time, you still incur loss. But you don't do learning multiple times anyway, right? So if you are talking about repeated training, that's a different scenario. But then if it is repeated training, that means that new data has come in. That means again you have to do subsampling. So it's not that uh, straightforward. Then other basic questions that, you know, when do we use uh, parallel algorithms optimized for this? Of course, you know, the obvious answers are here. Data can fit in a single machine. And uh, we already saw that most of the machine learning algorithms, right? The computations can be parallelized. You can is that and your communication infrastructure is pretty bad and you don't want to use it and uh, you know these are some of the numbers which shows that uh, about this communication time 
this yeah. And this we already talked about. We can't. I mean, you need distributed machine learning algorithms when data cannot fit in a single machine. We can't do subsampling. The other thing is the data itself naturally arrives in that uh, computer. So that's another thing. Data load time from disk to memory is high. So par as I, I gave you an example earlier that if you have one terabyte of data and if you are going to read it sequentially, that's going to take a lot of time. When you split it into 100 GB, reading each one uh, is uh, faster. So if you include that cost also, you know, this may still be a winner in some cases. So one thing that you have to watch out for is that although we talk about distributed machine learning algorithm, the speed up may not be always linear or something. Okay. So in fact, there is a nice uh, article on this which you can read here, which says basically that you know speed up improvement that you get is not what it is. Okay. So it's actually the data itself is like that, and then uh, um, you have no other way but to process it to that way. But it, it, in some sense, it is overstated here, in my opinion, because there are scenarios where it can be really beneficial. And uh, so we talked about two things, right? The multi-core shared subsystems versus distributed computing. Is there a comp hybrid uh, method? Yes, it is possible. And uh, and of course, you know, this is a famous thing. People use GPU systems for learning uh, deep neural nets. But then people also recently asked the question, is GPU systems only useful for deep neural nets or can I also use it for building, let's say, kernel models or even linear models? And recently there is some article which came, which actually shows that GPU systems are very good even in uh, those problems. So you can read more about it here. So finally, yeah, just to conclude, um, so basically, if the data can fit in um, memory, you know, you can just use multi-core systems so that you don't have to worry about, you know, this trading of computation, communication cost, and so on. Use the systems matched to, to the models. Okay. So currently, at least, we don't know any good solution where deep neural nets can be learned in a distributed setting, for example, in a Hadoop map reduce framework or something. Use better and appropriate programming frameworks. And we already talked about some uh, ways of making this computation and communication times the commons rate. And of course, you can always continue to design faster learning algorithms with better convergence rate. And finally, yeah, don't always expect a linear speed up with the number of nodes. So there are uh, you know few references. These are just a representative, but uh, you can get more references from these papers. Okay. So with that, I'll stop. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah, these slides will be made available. So I think uh, now. Yeah. Any questions? Sorry. Multi-threading on a node will be more efficient, or many mappers on a node. If there are uh, 10 nodes and we are giving the such a spark that there will be 30 mappers, so 10 mappers, 3 mappers on every node. Mm. If that will be more efficient or uh, w there are 3 threads running on a single map, single node. How many nodes, are, how many cores are there? Are ten, no 10 cores are there uh -huh. and 30 mappers we have assigned. So Correct. 3 mappers on every core. Correct. So that will be more efficient or there will be 3 threads on a single core. Parallel on distributed, you said. Oh, okay. Distributed, when you say distributed, I meant that there are multiple machines, yeah. right? So that's what. There are multiple cores which are. In running. each machine, you have multiple yeah. cores. Yeah, and in every core, there are three threads. Okay. Means we can. Do I mean, the main message is that, you know, wherever communication cost is involved, right? Just to be aware of it, okay. Understand that part that will tell you to make this design choice. That's what I think. Yeah. Any other questions? <coughs> so I have a brief question, uh, so more mm. high-level question. So uh, can you comment on uh, how uh, any of these distributed optimization methods can be transferred to sort of sequential uh, tasks of sequential nature, like uh, 
online prediction or something. Toss of uh, sequence. Where basically and data keeps coming in sequentially and you have to maintain some estimate. Uh, oh, I mean this so data I arrives in. Uh, not in a batch necessarily, but. Uh, oh, streaming yeah. scenario. Yeah, I don't have a good answer because I don't have a good experience with that. Okay, so yeah, but it's an interesting question. Too. I mean, the thing is, wh what is not clear is what is the underlying um, data distribution model that you have. So how the data itself arrives. See, in some sense, here you have sort of um, uh, set of nodes assigned to you, and then you are running jobs on them, right? Now. Let's say that the data is coming. So typically, you know, from your file system, data gets loaded into these machines or something. When they arrive, now you need to look at how this data is going to get distributed to these worker nodes, for example. So there is a distribution time cost involved there. So it's not clear to me how you can control and then uh, manage that. So you need to take that uh, distribution time also into account, which you probably you may not think too much in this particular scenario. So maybe you'll have to take that into account. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, correct. But the thing is that they take control of the entire nodes with you, right? Isn't it? So then you have some flexibility of when the data comes, how we are going to distribute it. And I think there's an additional scheduling component. Yeah, exactly, correct. So through which you can control and then do Direct things, the right? data to me. Exactly, correct. No, That's under your control, yeah. In this scenario, when your data comes in, you just assign like extra machine to store it. So what you have, you already found the optimal solution that you're trying to compare it to and then you will have come in and you want to find a new optimal point with this additional data. So can you mm -hmm. incrementally yeah, 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 use yeah. it to drive it to a new optimal solution? Yeah, that is possible, yeah. Okay, so if there are no more questions, let's thank uh, Dr. Sundar Rajan again. Uh, present him with a small uh, token of our appreciation. Thank you. Thanks, sir.